keyboards. One of the most of all time. It's even possible you've used one before. Allow me to take you on a journey of keyboards. Currently, I have a Corsair K70 low profile keyboard with Cherry MX Reds. It's a fantastic keyboard and has worked flawlessly over the past 8 years. So now I'm going to replace it with my own custom keyboard. Turns out there's a lot to this, so let us begin. Keyboards come in all shapes and sizes, but I decided I liked the 96% form factor as it kept the function row and the numpad, which I use for professional work. Add in the navigation cluster, and it's a great keyboard. Enter the Tofu 96. It looks amazing. The case, stabilizers, and PCB came as a bundle and was affordable, but there was just one issue. The numpad was on the right side of the keyboard. I'm left-handed, and I've always wanted a left numpad which is an actual deal breaker. Never mind that left-handed options exist in the wild. I was going to take this personally and do it right. And doing things right starts with the keyboard layout editor. I threw together a design I liked, drew an accompanying picture, and downloaded KiCad, a PCB software, once, twice, three times, and four times. It's far too expensive to outsource the PCB, so we're going to do it ourselves. Now, as a mechanical engineer with a focus in fluid mechanics and numerics, I've taken exactly one linear circuits class, so I'm definitely overqualified for PCB design. That's why I meticulously engaged in a process of observing and drawing inspiration from various existing design paradigms, integrating select elements and techniques discerned from... Oh hey, and while we were chatting, past Connor finished the design. Just kidding, this took 40 hours. Introducing the Banoa 102. It's also version 2 because version 1 sucked. My favorite parts were realizing that the microcontroller didn't fit, and I had to design my own RP2040 implementation, and putting the LED footprints on the wrong side of the board. Anyway, now we send off to a Chinese factory and wait a little bit. Thank you to Chad's, Noah Kaiser, and Joe Scotto for their tutorials on how to design keyboards. While we're waiting, let's talk about firmware for our RP2040. As a MATLAB and Fortran enjoyer, I'm totally qualified to write code in what I think is C. There's a .c at the end of the file, so it's probably C. We're using QMK, and there's a bit of a learning curve, as most of the documentation tells you to modify pre-existing configurations rather than create your own. I figured it out by looking at other people's code and making it work for my design. This is where an ultra-wide comes in handy. I compile once, a second time, and get it right the third time. Let's move on to more interesting things. Oh, and by the way, I made a mistake in that code that the Connor who was talking then will discover in about three or so months. Yeah, it's been three months. A lot has happened, but school and work and me being in general pretty stupid is a great way to lengthen time frames. I have, however, made some pretty good progress, so let's catch you up to date. First off, CAD. Using everyone's favorite CAD software, SolidWorks, I created a vision for the keyboard that I found to be both aesthetically pleasing and functional. It's also when I realized that I forgot to add mounting holes to the PCB. That'll be fixed later. Oh yeah, the PCBs came. Check them out, don't they look cool? Always do your CAD first, kids. Don't be me. Back to CAD. I stole some STL files of stabilizers and keycaps so I could properly envision how things would all fit together. For plate mounting, I decided to add features for allowing gasket mounting with pour-on foam. I can't find the calculations now, but I sat down and mathed out the foam deformation and necessary feature sizes to make everything work with stock straight off of McMaster's. So let's break it down. The case is split into two primary pieces, and the PCB is mounted to the plate, and the plate is gasket mounted. Sizing follows typical Cherry MX switch dimensions, and everything is with M2 bolts to keep the walls aesthetically thin. Great. I also did some structural analysis to check my design for failure modes. I was curious to see how my keyboard would handle buckling, as it somewhat resembles a slender beam. As it turns out, it can handle the weight of an adult rhino pretty well. There's some deformation, but this can be resolved by scaling the legend. And yes, 
I set this up solely to make that joke. As a motivational aside, if you ever feel useless, remember the ANSYS mechanical loading bar exists. Let's jump back over to the PCB. I separated all the essential components into cups for organization and got them soldered on the PCB. I made the brilliant decision to hand solder 0402 components, which was a little bit painful. I also reflow soldered the 56 pin QFN RP2040 chip by holding a 400 degrees Celsius fan at my legs while balancing the PCB over the table. Questionable decisions all around. Then after a quick continuity check, I plugged the PCB into my makeshift reverse current protected port for my laptop, and pretty wacky, my computer detected a new device. Even wackier, the chip allowed me to flash it. And even crazier, when I connected the key terminals with a pair of tweezers, I got input key presses showing up on the screen. Pretty cool. Also note I skipped a large portion of the work to get this to function. In particular, I broke all PCBs testing them and had to redesign and reorder them, and I fixed that code bug I mentioned earlier. Okay, so we've got a working keyboard. Kind of. It still needs a casing. And keys. And a board. So let's work on that. Fabrication was a lot more complex than I initially envisioned. I decided to CNC machine the case out of aluminum and the plate out of stainless steel. Let's talk about the plate first, as it's the easier of the two. My go-to reaction was to laser cut it, but this didn't work out as the heat and material removal released the internal stresses and warped the part badly. I then turned to the water jet and got a good part. However, at about 90% through the operation, the water jet clogged, and although I didn't realize it at the time, the cut resumed about 1mm offset from where it should have been, and that can be rectified later. So great, the plate's acquired. I also laser cut the foam inserts on a CO2 laser. This was surprisingly easy, and I got it right pretty quickly. I don't have any videos, but here's the results. My aesthetic design choices for the case came with increased work holding difficulty. I embarked on a number of side quests with the help and recommendations of the shop staff to make custom fixtures and to test things before doing it on the real part, with the goal of minimizing deformation from clamping, to properly machine all the angles I wanted, and to minimize risk. This sounds simple, but my 3D visualization skills failed me here. I found it incredibly difficult to envision the origin of new setups when multiple angles and parts stacked on top of each other and modeled everything in CAD first. The fixtures and clamps were mostly done on manual mills. Parts were imported from SolidWorks into Fusion 360 for CAM, and a lot of time was spent here planning out the sequence of operations and setups while trying to minimize machine time. With CAM in a good place, I started machining first doing the back face, then the top and sides, and finally the bottom. The mill makes a really nice sound as it moves material. Also check out this Kelvin Helmholtz instability that developed as coolant came out of the slot on the table. I've investigated this phenomenon for my research, and it's really cool to see it occur in the wild. Test fitting everything was a somewhat scary process, but to my delight everything worked as intended. The foam and plate meshed perfectly, and the case held all components in place very firmly. This summary of the process does not even begin to scratch the surface of the work put in to arrive here. Months of effort were required to reach this point, but it was absolutely delightful to see the vision start to take shape in reality. I also want to thank the machine shop staff, as this would have been impossible without their knowledge and input. I spent about a day filing and dremeling the plate to get it exactly how I wanted and to fix the water jet offset mistake. Then came the stabilizer and switch test fitting. Then came cleaning the PCB to get rid of the flux residue with IPA. I also 3D printed some spacers for the plate and PCB. And finally, I assembled the completed PCB with plate, switches, stabilizers, and components, and plugged the assembly into my laptop. And everything worked first try, which made me extremely satisfied. I ran through every key with a keyboard checker and got all green lights. This meant I was close to the end. There was only a few more items to complete. Connor from the future here. It's been like another six to eight weeks and I have a midterm tomorrow that I don't want to think about, so I was talking about wrapping things up. Let's go through the quick and easy changes that I have implemented. First, 
The more astute viewers will have noticed that the keyboard case I've been showing off the whole time is not fully complete, as the front face still has an ugly step on it. I fixed this on a manual mill by tilting the head to the right angle and then simply facing the part. This was a surprisingly simple fix to the more complex fixturing problem I've been thinking about for some time. Tramming the head back into place wasn't as fun though. I also got the case hard anodized locally. It looks beautiful and everything still meshes really nicely. I then cut some additional foam pieces for mounting the plate in different thicknesses of foam, which gave me options for how springy I wanted the gasket mounting setup to be. My lack of foresight placed the daughterboard header right next to the bottom of the case ribs, so I cut a little groove for it that fit nicely. I also laser cut some pour on foam for creating a good sound profile. It also reminds me of the inside of a MacBook laptop. One of the final tasks I decided to commit to was making custom aluminum keycaps. I have been toying with the idea in my head for a while, and after drawing up CAD and CAM, I decided it was feasible. I knew beginning this process would require significant time invested in both design and manufacturing, but the sunken cost fallacy doesn't apply here because I foresaw the potential future costs and decided to embark on it, as opposed to incurred costs that I am trying to recuperate. Anyway, like all good plans, it started with a picture. I then made a parameter-driven design that allowed easy modifications to key geometry to rapidly generate all key sizes and profiles, along with accompanying fixtures. It ended up being about 30 unique parts, of which 20 were one-offs like the spacebar. I then spent some time putting together cam and tool paths I liked. Based off the design needs, I then ordered the tooling I needed for special features such as the 364 slots. I also convinced the people in charge of the CNC machines I was a sane individual who just so happened to want to machine over a hundred parts. Great. Good to go. Here's me making the first part out of plastic on a Tormach PCNC 1100, as I wanted to dial in my cam and get things right before moving to aluminum. I then amped it up and made the first key in aluminum, and satisfied with the process, I started making five at a time. After successfully reconvincing the staff of my sanity, I started using a Tormach 1100MX to make keys faster, as the spindle can achieve double the RPMs, which at a high level means I can remove material faster and thus bring down cycle times. Another benefit was the 1100MX used BT30 tool holders, which meant I did not have to manually do tool offsets anymore, saving significant time. Testing and optimization brought total cycle time for 5 1 unit keys from 6 hours to under 2.5 hours, which I think is pretty good. And after successfully tricking the staff into thinking I'm sane yet again, I got approval to use two Tormach 1100MXs simultaneously to slash production times one final time. Utilizing what I learned from the R&D period, I began machining in earnest and dedicated all my available free time to producing keycaps. On one of the days, over an 8 hour period with no breaks, I made 36 keys which translates to about 26 minutes a key. I'm pretty happy with that, but I also think I could bring the time down with some more tuning. Such is the game. Check out my calendar during this crunch time where I average about 25 hours a week manufacturing. And that's not including the time I spent preparing CAM files for when the facility is open. I didn't do a fantastic job of documenting this time until the end, so whatever is on the screen is probably all I've got. Needless to say, it was an interesting time to balance my part-time job, research, full student status, and senior engineering capstone project as well as personal agenda, resulting in some long days and careful time management. Luckily, my capstone project had me working in a clean room to produce microfluidic chips with soft photolithography, and I often had to reserve machine time or lab space at wacky hours such as 10pm or 4am. It doesn't sound great, but this was actually a blessing in disguise that allowed me to pursue my hobbies during the day in normal shop operating hours while also making good progress on my design project. Looking back, the keycap endeavor would not have been possible if I had been assigned a capstone project that required my attention during the day, so this was rather fortunate. The rest of the machining went relatively uninterrupted. Doing the one-off keys was slowly at steady progress, and the total process from start to end took about 6 weeks, with the earnest machining on the 1100MX starting about a third of the way through, and the dual 1100MX usage starting halfway in. I'd say there's a 3-4 to four week period where I was spending anywhere from 3-8 to eight hours a day, 6 days a week manufacturing keycaps. For the final key, I realized I had done a poor job of documenting the progress, so I brought in the GoPro and made a quick custom fixture out of the GoPro mount and a dial indicator arm to record machining on a keycap up close. 
Overall, I used about 110 hours of machine time, and I would attribute about 25% of that to R&D. If I were to do it again, I'm confident I could cut the time significantly with the knowledge and experience gained. Here are some pictures of the keys going on the keyboard for the first time. I also machined an alignment tool to help dial in the keycap stems to ensure proper positioning on the board. I gotta say, it looks beautiful. The light bounces off every facet of the keys and shimmers as you change position with respect to the board. Pictures and video do not do it justice. I also installed the daughter board and plugging it into the computer to do a check shows all keys work, which is a relief. It also lines up rather nicely with some SolidWorks renders I made to help visualize what I was investing my time in. Looks pretty good. Now, I'm aware about 5 minutes ago, I said there's only a few more things to do, so I have just a few more things to do. With the keyboard mostly complete, I brought it onto campus to show some of the people who supported and took interest in the project. Here's Mark getting 140 words per minute on a typing test, which is a pretty good verification and validation test that everything's working as intended. I also got all the keycaps anodized in Type 2 clear. Here's me unboxing and installing them on the board. The anodizing process muted the reflection somewhat but they still look absolutely pristine and catch the light wonderfully. I also swapped out some switch springs for 80 grams instead of 67 grams. This offsets the extra weight of the aluminum keycap material, and I also lubed each switch with Crytox 205 Grade 0 after testing them with and without lube and becoming convinced of the superior sound profile. This took some time, but the results are obvious. Here's a quick comparison. Thanks for making it this far, and I hope you'll indulge me for just a few more moments. I graduated from college in about two weeks with a degree in mechanical engineering, a specialization in fluid mechanics, and I'll be continuing on to grad school in mechanical engineering and fluid mechanics next year. It's really shocking how fast the time went by. I remember moving out and beginning my college experience very clearly, and at the time I wasn't too enthused about starting a new chapter of my life after having just found my footing in high school. However, over the past four years, the exceptional peers and mentors I've surrounded myself with have helped me succeed, explore opportunities I didn't know existed, and develop my interests for my field of study. I'm not really sure what the future holds, as I'm still considering whether to do a PhD or to go into industry after my master's, but I'm excited and confident that the foundation I have built will enable me to succeed in whatever I choose to do and make an impact in doing it. Now I'm pretty fortunate as I get more than just a keyboard out of this. Along the way, I picked up a variety of multidisciplinary skills such as PCB design, a limited proficiency in a new coding language, along with a serious boost in confidence when it comes to machining. Fabricating all parts of the keyboard was a blast, and in the not-so-distant future I intend to own my own CNC machine. But I think perhaps the most useful skill of them all is more experience with design for manufacturing. Anyone can drop a pretty CAD model, but to know how to leverage your available tools and skills to bring a model into reality in an efficient and cost-effective manner takes time and careful forethought. This project was an exercise in DFM, dependencies, and problem-solving towards a goal with complex nuances. I'm confident the knowledge gained will be directly applicable to future work. Obviously, I need to thank the individuals who gave me the tools and knowledge to be able to pull off this project. Thank you very much to Tom, Steve, David, and Mark, who gave me the opportunity to pursue a passion and learn a few things along the way. These guys go out of their way every day to help students bring their ideas into reality, and their experience, aid, and mentorship is truly appreciated and valued. The things I do would not be possible without their support, and it is because of their willingness to indulge my crazy ideas, along with providing access to tools and enabling autonomy, that this can be pulled off. Massive thank you. And that's about it. 6 months, 1700 components, 800 hours, and more money than I'd like to admit later, I have a keyboard I'm proud to call both custom and my own. That is, until I decide to one-up myself and replace this one also. Thanks for watching, and have a great day.